Hello, I'm Kathleen Olive. The world of 18th century Japan was clearly demarcated, with those at the top enjoying a life of ease, intellectual stimulation, and great cultural refinement. Their taste for expensive materials and their sophisticated ways of appreciating their use and the stories they told led to the development of a new school of art. Rinpa, as it's known, is named for Ogata Korin, the child of Kyoto textile artisans who became one of the 18th century's greatest artists, working in painting, lacquerware, ceramics, and other decorative art forms. Today, I'm speaking with Limelight Arts Travel's Nick Gordon about Corin's magnificent iris screens, a pair of folding screens painted in blue and green on gold foil. Today, they're preserved in Tokyo's extraordinary Nezu Museum. And as they are a wide work across two screens of six panels each, we really recommend that you click on the links below to take a closer look at both screens in detail. Good morning, Kathleen. Morning, Nick. So what have you brought in to talk about with us today? I have chosen a pair of folding screens or byobu that are in the Nezu Museum in Tokyo and they were made by an artist called Ogata Kordin. And whenabouts was Ogata Korin working? He was working in the very early years of the 18th century, so it's generally thought that this artwork was made around about 1701 to 1705. And this is a period of great importance for Japanese arts and crafts. It's what we refer to as the Edo period. And it's generally thought to be this moment when Japan becomes a bit of a closed shop, both politically uh, and also in terms of trade and commerce and Japanese artists like Korin start really refining what's thought to be a very local aesthetic. And could you describe what it is that we're looking at? Right, so we're looking at two sets of folding screens. They have six panels each, which means that they can be concertinaed across a space in order to divide up a space. They're not particularly high. They're about one and a half metres high and they're about three and a half metres wide. So it was quite a large room that they must have uh, divided up when they were set out together. And they are painted in only two colours, a very deep ultramarine and a green on a backdrop entirely made of sheets of gold foil. So we've got on each of the folding screens, we've got a line of irises that makes its way across the, screen, the screens on against a background of shimmering gold foil. And you can imagine what they would look like inside inside a room with the light, especially in the evening, reflecting off that gold. Absolutely. Japanese aesthetics have long had, for really practical kind of reasons, a great respect for works that have a shimmer in low light. Japanese houses, these screens were designed for domestic use by a very wealthy person, obviously, but Japanese houses had quite low light as part of the, the design of the house. And so work like this set against gold foil would really have shimmered as you walked past it. So these were kinds of works that you didn't sit in front of and consider like we might with a painting in a gallery. They were objects in your house that you tended to walk alongside you tended to see these obliquely and uh, and that might explain with the concertina folds of it as well that will give you a, an amazing sense of of depth that you're not looking at a flat surface of viruses you're looking at a field of viruses extending into the gold absolutely so these are quite specifically designed to represent a field of irises against a marshy river and we can talk about why they're specifically designed to represent that scene but yes obliqueness is really important in the design so when we look at these flat on a screen it's quite difficult to get a sense of their effect it looks like a, a really reasonably random and asymmetrical grouping of irises on each of the, the screens that we have as a pair here. But when they're concertinaed, they actually make, when you walk 
obliquely past them a very straight diagonal line on each screen and you're, you're meant to read these almost like you would read a text so you would you're meant to walk past them from right to left and when you do that you get quite a straight line when you look at them obliquely as they're concertinaed uh, across a room and you can still have this effect you can do this Essentially every May in the Nezu Museum in Tokyo, uh, irises bloom in May in Japan. And so very seasonal aesthetic. The museum brings them out into a special darkened room every May. And you can actually try it out walking past them obliquely to see how those, those lines work. And then you can go out into the Nezu Museum's very beautiful garden and see their own irises in bloom in the stream that runs through the bottom of the Nezu garden. So that, that's, that's seasonal aesthetic that the museum has in terms of how they display these biobu was also part of the original intent of the work. So these were screens that you would have displayed in May when the irises were blooming and then in, in summer you would have brought out a different work probably with morning glories for example in winter a different pair of screens again so you would have changed these screens every season and partly for conservation reasons but partly also to honour that seasonal aesthetic the Nezu Museum only brings them out when the irises in their own garden are in bloom. Well, it's another wonderful example of that uh, Japanese sensibility for uh, fleeting beauty, for, for something that's only there for a few weeks and then it disappears. Uh, there are other kind of associations with irises in particular in Abs spring. Yeah, absolutely. So, in fact, it is capturing that fleeting or transient sense of beauty that you describe, something that the Japanese have a great appreciation for. They even have a term for describing this, the beauty of objects that aren't with us for very long. It makes them even more beautiful because they're transient. And there was a whole school of literature, particularly poetry, that celebrated this kind of transient beauty of things or mono no aware as it's known. And in fact, these screens are capturing in an artistic and decorative medium an episode from a very important 9th century collection of poems. These are known as the Tales of Ize. Ize is a place in Japan that has a very ancient Shinto shrine that's associated with the earlier stories of Japanese origin myths. And in this story, this loose collection of vaguely interconnected and interwoven poems, a, a haiku style of poem known as waka, these collections of poems more or less trace the life of a, a hapless protagonist who has been caught in an, uh, an um, unfaithful moment with his wife and is going on a long kind of journey of almost self-imposed exile. And he comes to a, a bridge across a river and when he's crossing this bridge, it's a bridge made out of eight interlocking planks of wood and as he goes to cross the bridge he notices irises blooming in profusion just as we see here and the beauty of the irises as he goes to cross the eight planked bridge bridge uh, inspire him to spontaneously compose a poem that describes his circumstances and the poem is an is an acrostic so the first syllables of each line spell out the Japanese word irises and it's a poem that reflects reflects on his distance from his wife in this self-imposed exile uh, due to his unfaithfulness. And this is a really important episode in Japanese literature. It's a foundational 9th century text for Japanese poetry uh, and literature. And that particular episode is so famous that it even has its own name. So it's known as the Yatsubashi episode, the eight planked bridge episode. And so although it looks here that we're seeing just a, a very abstract pair of screens with irises on a gold back, background, in fact, an educated viewer in a privileged viewing context in the 18th century would have immediately recognised that these irises are referring to that poem, that in fact it's a reference to that episode from the tales of Ize. So it's also really important that the Nezu display these screens when their own irises are in bloom because they're also making that connection between the original literary episode that inspired these screens. And I'd really encourage 
encourage people when they visit Japanese gardens to look for eight planked bridges and where you find an eight planked bridge across a little stream or river in a traditional Japanese garden you'll always find irises planted alongside evoking the tales of Ize episode that's referenced in these screens too. Well, that's pretty fantastic, and thank you. It's also something else we can uh, look for next time we're in Japan. We'll be counting bridge planks wherever we go to pick the, uh, the, the 9th century literary reference. I was wondering then, so, so back in the 18th century when these were created, you mentioned that you could expect a, uh, an educated audience who would be able to afford something uh, made of lapis lazuli and gold uh, to be able to pick that. Uh, but how far down into society do you think people would have been able to, to pick up on those references? Well, not as far down as we might like in the 18th century. So in the 18th century, Japan was a very stratified world with really clear distinctions between its classes. People didn't really move between those classes very much. So this is absolutely a work of elite production that would have been understood by refined intellectuals who spent their time studying these texts and learning how to appreciate arts, uh, works of art like the literary texts that in inspired these screens and also probably by Buddhist monks in monasteries for in fact for most of their history these screens were actually displayed in a really significant Buddhist monastery Higashi uh, Honganji in Kyoto which is not far from Kyoto railway station today it was a really large and important still is a really large and important monastery so these kind of educated viewers would certainly have been able to look at these works and read their literary allusions but Japanese today have a very broad Broad cultural understanding of their own heritage and tradition and Japanese people today when they go to the Nezu Museum and these and see these screens or visit a Japanese garden and notice an eight planked bridge they would catch the allusions to the tales of Ize they would catch the seasonal references in work such as these because that's still a really important part of Japanese aesthetics today and they would certainly make the connection between the irises in bloom in the Nezu garden and the iris screens being displayed upstairs in, inside the museum. So although in the early 18th century this was a very closed world of references, today within Japan there's a, a really extraordinary appreciation for their own aesthetic traditions that would resonate with viewers. But in between the 18th century and viewers who see this work in Japan today, it certainly had an impact in the late 19th and early 20th century on other generations of artists, particularly in Western Europe, when work such as these started to have an impact thanks to their transmission through woodblock prints. So if you're talking about this uh, stylistically then, you're kind of hinting at it goes on to have an international uh, significance. Uh, was this a style of work or was this a work itself kind of a foundational work in the development of a new style? Yeah, absolutely, both in its uh, origin and also then in its influence. So in its origin, it's considered one of the most significant works of a school of art in Japan that's known as Rinpa. In fact, it's called Rinpa after this artist, Ogata Korin, so you can hear the Rin syllable in the end of his um, family name and that becomes the name for a whole st uh, school of painting. It's known as the Rin School after the works of this particular artist. So it sets a real standard for a luscious, excessive, elegant, uh, wealthy aesthetic in Japan. And then when works such as these are collected in a stylized book of woodblock prints that shows foundational works from the Rinpa School, those collections of woodblock prints start to be disseminated quite widely at the end of the 19th century after Japan opens up to the to the world again at the end of the Edo period. This work is from the beginning of the Edo period and at the end of the Edo period in the 19th century, Japan opens up to the world. And work such as woodblock prints, which were quite uh, inexpensive uh, and could be spread quite easily, they start to arrive in Western Europe and North America in really large export numbers. Numbers and they start to have an, an extraordinary impact on artists such as Vincent van Gogh, who actually collects uh, Japanese woodblock prints himself uh, and 
owned in fact a collection of woodblock prints showing uh, in line drawings work such as this one. So we know that he did actually see a line drawing of these screens. He wouldn't have been able to see the screens themselves. They were still tucked away in a monastery in Kyoto at that point in time. But he certainly saw line drawings of this work and it's believed that that has a real impact not just on his own paintings of irises but also of his approach to style. So an interest in asymmetry, an interest in abstraction, uh, interest in new kinds of perspectives, you know, those irises in the uh, in the screen that seem so close to us but are cut off at the bottom of the screen. Really interesting way of seeing objects quite different from the Western canon. So certainly work such as this one uh, have a really strong afterlife and change. Uh, Western painting at the end of the 19th century really have an impact on the Impressionists and the post-Impressionists in particular. Well, thank you. It's amazing to be able to look at this work and kind of suddenly know that we can be looking at a reference to 9th century Japanese literature and the inspiration for Vincent van Gogh at the same time. It's, a, it's really quite extraordinary. So thank you very much, Kathleen. Thanks, Nick. You've been listening to Limelight Arts Travels podcast, A Closer Look. It was recorded on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and we acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional custodians of this land and their elders past and present.